And without further ado, I am delighted to welcome to the stage for our opening keynote, CEO and co-founder at Snorkel AI, Alex Ratner. A fun fact about Alex, I've been told that his orthogonal career choice, if he hadn't founded Snorkel and become the CEO, would have been to pursue a path to becoming the creative marketing director at Taco Bell. We can only wonder about the impact Alex would have had on the world of fast food. And one of my colleagues, Hamza Iqbal, who's a part-time stand-up comedian, uh, had a line he wanted to share. It is, Alex would have made Crunchwrap Supreme-centric AI the taco of the town. So no doubt the world would have benefited in some way had Alex pursued this creative path with Taco Bell, but we are glad he started Snorkel. With that, welcome, Alex. Happy to have you here today. Rebecca, thank you so much for the intro. I, I had not heard that wonderful pun before. Yeah, I guess I should give a little background on that. We we um uh, we ask everyone, every new snorkeler that joins to talk about what they're, uh, they're totally different. I guess we were using the word orthogonal and then that was, uh, we were told that was a little nerdy. So what your very different uh, uh, career path would be if it wasn't in uh, in you know, AI and, and data-centric AI. And I've always thought Taco Bell is a pinnacle of creativity and fast food and a guilty pleasure of mine. So I, I say, just for the record, a creative director. I don't want to get too too ambitious when I clearly would have to, a whole new trade to learn. Um, but anyway, now that you're convinced, I have uh, a very sophisticated uh, um, a very sophisticated palette on the weekend. Uh, let's jump into actual AI stuff. So it's really exciting. I think we're at I see 500 and something and climbing participants. Thank you all so much for joining. We're really excited to try to make this a useful session for all of you today. And so uh, again, the agenda is online. Really, really excited to be kind of blending enterprise and you know, kind of like uh, applied real world enterprise perspectives, which you know personally I think is extremely important uh, more than ever at this kind of moment of the hype cycle where there have been uh, a tremendous amount of chips put down on AI for good reason, right? We, we've gone through a once in a decade step change forward in the in the best base techniques and models and, and infrastructure. But now it's time to actually convert that from flashy demos to real production. And as many of you on this call, I'm, I'm guessing no, and I'm guessing that's part of why you're here, it's a lot tougher than, uh, um, you know, than it seems when you're building that demo with the out of the box model. So, you know, we're going to blend some of, you know, the state of the art research that we take part in and are connected through, uh, you know, Snorkel, Stanford, UW, other academic institutions on kind of how to actually tune and customize and improve these models to production readiness, get some of the Snorkel perspective on how we're doing that, including uh, a deep dive uh, with some of our research team on the model that we just posted yesterday, which is on, on top of the Alpaca 2.0 or Alpaca Eval 2.0 leaderboard using something or part of a line of work that we refer to as programmatic alignment. Um, and then uh, also, and in many ways, most importantly, get the, the industry perspectives on how is this actually shaking out? Where are people you know, actually finding paths to real production value with these exciting, but, um, but very demo heavy techniques and I'm really excited to be talking with um, uh, some of our partners from QBE and BNY for um, two very exciting looks at that. So with that, I'm going to give a little bit of an intro and overview, and I'll use some of what we build here at Snorkel and some of the directions we're pursuing as a concrete example of what we mean by data-centric AI and, and how we think of using data and, and, and performing data development in service of real production um, AI. But obviously, I'm going to try to touch on bigger picture topics that will be applicable to uh, to everything uh, and everyone um, in the world of AI development, and not just not just Snorkel users. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so now jumping in, um, I'm going to walk through some of the high level stuff, uh, both our you know our our view that really has stayed pretty constant over the last decade, starting uh, with the Snorkel project at Stanford. Um, then uh, over at UW, uh, where, where I, I get to co-advise some wonderful students uh, still, and then um, at the company at Snorkel on how data and data development, um, and going one click deeper, what we call programmatic approaches to data development can be critical to actually productionizing uh, and customizing AI. So we'll jump in now. I'll, I'll start uh, by, by kind of sharing my, my POV on where we are. And uh, I want to be very clear that, you know, we have been all in on what we often call large language or foundation models, um, or sometimes just Gen AI for 
uh, for years now. Uh, I guess we were using what are now called small language models back when they were thought of as big language models like, like BERT and the like in production with customers for many years and thinking about how that fits into uh, an AI development workflow. Um, so we think that this is, you know, the absolutely the correct way to build AI. And we think that the, the scale up starting with ChatGPT over the last year have been indeed a, 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 you know, a once in a decade step change forward for the practice of AI and the tools available to practitioners. That being said, we are going through a hype cycle. That is an opinion, but I think it's barely one. Um, there's always a hype cycle. There's always a rush to flashy demos, to low hanging fruit use cases, you know, the easier ones maybe that have, you know, simpler data or, or uh, less complex objectives or lower, um, you know, lower bars for accuracy and performance before they can be shipped. And those, you know, uh, further build the hype. And then, you know, people try to start moving uh, to some more complex and more domain specific and more consequential and therefore uh, difficult use cases and realize that hmm, out of the box, uh, you know, plug a couple things together in a Python script doesn't uh, always work. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. You know, what does that, that, that second peak look like? How do we actually get this amazing technology from demo? And in some cases from production use cases in, in some uh, theaters of operation, to actually working on complex high value enterprise use cases. And I'll note that a lot of, uh, a lot of this is kind of baked into the terminology that we like to use. Uh, this is the, the term foundation model that um, uh, is used at a Stanford and, 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 and we often use it here at the company Snorkel. I, I'm double clicking on this because I think it's important for the high level perspective. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, these models are, are, have long since gone multimodal. So it's not just language, you know, large language model is a little bit of a misnomer when a lot of the most exciting activity is in image, uh, video, structured data, graph data, et cetera, et cetera. Time series with, you know, we've got some exciting motion in terms of the post transformer architectures like uh, structured state space uh, models and, and others that, that are incredible at long sequence lengths. Um, so it's not just language, uh, even though we love language. Um, it's not just generative use cases. A lot of what are often called analytical or predictive workloads classifying, tagging, predicting, et cetera, can be accelerated and boosted with these models. And I think most importantly for the perspective of, of this talk, uh, you know, our strong view is that these models are foundations. They're incredible first mile tools for most production use cases, especially in enterprises that have their own complex data and high, high bar for production, um, you still need to build the proverbial house on top. And what that house looks like and what it needs to, what spec it needs to meet is dependent on what use case and what, what you know, what kind of data and, and setting you're working in. So that's the metaphor that I think is a good framing one for really uh, everything else uh, in the talk. So going a click deeper, a lot of our, our view, and this is, you know, a little bit of a, a marketing catchphrase, but is that, you know, really, you, you know, most users are going to have to build a, a GPTU, something that's customized to their data, their use cases, their settings, their, uh, you know, objectives and constraints versus a, you know, a GPT-4, 5, 6, um, you know, that was trained on generic internet data towards, you know, generic uh, objectives. And the key to doing this is really all about the data. And, you know, the, the, the one line perspective here is that if you're an enterprise practitioner, you're going to have to, at some point for some of your uh, applications, especially the most important high value complex ones, you're going to have to use your data, develop it, curate it, and, and tune these models on it. Um, versus just using out of the box. And in fact, um, another way of phrasing this is all about specialization. Uh, we think that most enterprises and most, and I just use that as a proxy for organization, most you know, settings are not just going to be served by one giant model. Um, they're going to require uh, a mix of larger and smaller specialist models. Um, just like, you know, in society of, you know, with, with us, with us antiquated humans, we, we value both generalists, but you know, a lot of the highest value skill sets and jobs are done by, by highly trained specialists who become narrow in an area and very efficient at the task. Um, you know, we see enterprise AI really moving in that direction for both accuracy, but also cost and latency reasons. Uh, you don't need a gigantic model that was trained on all the internet that knows everything from Klingon poetry to, you know, to how to, uh, you know, ace a, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, IC coding interview. Um, to really efficiently decide whether a loan should be accepted or not, for example. Um, and in fact, it's actually less accurate and a lot slower and bigger and ex more expensive to do so. So 
a lot of this uh, this arc of what we think production of AI is going to look like is all about taking, you know, starting with these big foundational models. They're the foundations you start on, and tuning and specializing and shrinking, or what's called distilling them into into specialists that match specific use cases and objectives with high accuracy and and performant SLAs. So let's talk about how that's done and how data is arguably, or, or rather, data development is arguably the critical um, and, and most difficult step. In, in, in traversing that arc. Um, before jumping into that and, and just focusing on the accuracy part, it's worth noting that uh, most results show that if you survey a wide variety of tasks, the kind of out of the box model that was trained on the internet is, is you know, not generally act, uh, you know, the, the most accurate. Here, this was a, a meta review and obviously the field moves fast. And so this is uh, from uh, I think October of 2023. So ancient, ancient uh, text in the machine learning world today, but it's a, it's a meta review. Uh, not affiliated with any of uh, with with uh, any of our associated academic labs to be neutral. 150 tasks around natural language processing. That's 78 percent of the time. A smaller specialized model that was fine tuned for a specific objective and data type outperforms the ChatGPT baseline. This is not to be negative on ChatGPT. Just note that most you know uh, of the value comes from starting at that base and then specializing, building the the, the house on top. One way to think about the space of use cases is, um, I mean, obviously, you know, understanding what use cases work with what methods and tools is one of the most difficult challenges in AI, especially because people have this uh, mentality of, you know, um, everything, you know, uh, the core tools applying generically to every problem out there. And that's true for models, it's true for algorithms today, which is miraculous project uh, progress, but it's not true for the rest of the tool chain, in, in, including, you know, what you do with uh, um, the data and fine tuning and et cetera. So if we just focus on two axes, this is a heuristic that I find useful. You know, think about the y-axis here as data complexity and the x-axis as, as accuracy requirements. Um, you know, think about uh, you know going up is going to more complex private domain-specific data, and going to the right as going to use cases that require higher accuracy or equivalent metrics to ship to production. So this lower left quadrant in this simple view, that's kind of like the use cases where you know maybe it's on data that's very simple, very similar to internet, you know, public internet data that the models uh, that we use were generally pre-trained on, um, and that either has a low accuracy requirement, you know, maybe it's uh, an assistant tool or it's a demo, um, or it's it's you know not in a high value uh, scenario, or maybe there, there's not even a way to measure accuracy. It's a creative uh, copilot that is just kind of giving suggestions or starting points, and we don't even have a metric that we use for accuracy. That describes a lot of the the, the Gen AI use cases out there today. As you move up into the right, you get into the zone where actually you have to um, uh, you have to hit a pretty high bar for accuracy before you can, you know, for example, ship an anti money laundering uh, application at a bank or a uh, a patient triage model at a hospital system, and where you're operating over much more complex private data that wasn't out there on the internet for uh, you know the the GPT four five six seven of the world uh, to to learn from ahead of time, and that's where you generally need to see development. Um, so I like to think about this as a frame, framing point of, you know, where, do, where could you expect, you know, these large language models or foundation models to work out of the box, i.e., you know, prompting zero few shot if you want to get into the details, versus where are they likely going to require some tuning? And as you can probably guess, we tend to focus on that upper right quadrant, where a lot of the enterprise value actually sits when you think about production ROI, and it's also um, what, what I'll be focusing on the rest of the, the, the talk. So how do you actually do that development for those use cases that are on more complex data that have to hit higher bars for accuracy that don't, don't just work or are not likely to just work out of the box? Well, um, you know, it used to be, if you look back when we started the Snorkel project in you know, 20, 2012, 2013, that um, data was some janitorial thing that AI people, quote unquote, didn't, didn't, you know, didn't do, didn't have to deal with. Um, yeah, you downloaded something from Kaggle or ImageNet, or you got a spreadsheet from a line of business team or some outsourced mechanical turkers. Uh, and then you started your real work as an AI uh, developer or data scientist of uh, tweaking and tuning and developing models and algorithms, et cetera. And, you know, that was a lot of what, you know, we studied and, and, and taught and, and built. I'm sure it's what a lot of folks here in the audience, uh, you know, have, have done for many years and, and learned about. Effectively, I'll say in the era of foundation models ahead of us, that, that's basically dead. I don't say that with pleasure. And obviously there's always work on the model architectures, the algorithms, but for the average practitioner, trying to ship a real world use case. You don't go and improve your model when it's a you know 
seven to 700 billion parameter model by tweaking some parameters in the transformer or by uh, changing the algorithm that everyone uses. You effectively only have data as your interface, as your programming interface for AI in the foundation model or, or LLM era. So this is what we mean by data-centric development. It's a fundamental shift in the center of the data scientists or AI developers workflow from data being this kind of fixed input that they just received and models and algorithms being the toolkit to really everything flipping on its head, the models, the algorithms being pretty black box, pretty commodity standard, often open source, and the data development being the key. And by data development, by the way, I mean everything from curating a, a pre-training data set to uh, labeling and sampling and filtering a fine-tuned data set uh, to creating a preferences data set. We, we uh, have, have a cool result that um, uh, some of our team members are going to talk about later in the session that just uh, topped the Alpaca eval uh, leaderboard around programmatic data development for alignment, i.e. RLHF, DPO, if you've heard of those terms. Um, it could mean developing the data that goes into a prompt. The key is that you're not developing the model architecture or, or parameters directly. You're not developing the algorithms. You're developing the data that goes in. And as a side note, um, you know, so you know our perspective, and I'll talk about this a bit more, and, and uh, it'll be a little bit of a rush, but you know, our main focus at Snorkel is trying to make that data development first class in our in our data development platform, uh, Snorkel Flow, and to make it more programmatic, not automatic, not push button automagic, uh, but programmatic like software development. So we have users write code either directly or uh, indirectly via no code interfaces for programmatic operators, labeling functions, sampling functions, things like that, we call them to do this data development like software development versus like click, click, click. Um, so we'll get into that in a little bit. But before I go on, I, I, I note a lot of uh, you, uh, especially those who have maybe heard of or come across uh, the Snorkel project, either academic or commercial before, probably associated us with labeling. Uh, but it's worth noting that both the academic project over the last decade um, and uh, our current platform we're really focused on uh, data development operators more generally and making all of them programmatic. So this does include labeling. You know, is this a cat or a dog? Is this an angry or content customer in this call transcript, et cetera? Uh, but it also includes slicing the data to find subsets that are really important to evaluate and, and, and optimize, sampling the right mixture of data and topics to fine tune your model on, filtering. I think I saw someone in the Q&A asking about um, about uh, or, or saying they were you know struggling to to adjust the tone of a, a, a chatbot. So a key operation is filtering the fine tuning data set for the tone that you're looking for. Um, augmenting with synthetic data or, or data uh, uh, augmentation techniques. So all of these are operations that you do to the data um, to then you know fine tune or otherwise uh, uh, adjust your model. And all of them, by the way, can be made programmatic, both to be faster but also more structured more like software development. So just to give some examples, and, and I'm gonna start with one that's not Snorkel specific at all. This is a project uh, that some um, of the UW team and a bunch of others, uh, including some Snorkel participation worked on um, called DataComp. Uh, the paper was was uh, presented as an oral at NeurIPS, one of the big ML conferences just this year, if you're curious for some of the, the details. But at a high level, we set up a contest uh, for multimodal models like CLIP. Um, and we fixed all of the code for the model and the algorithm and just let users edit the data, not even labeling yet. This is a pre-training data set. So uh, uh, basically curating, sampling, filtering the data set. And just by doing those data operations, not even labeling yet, you get a new state of the art at compute parity that beats everything, including OpenAI. Again, it's just accentuating this point that the data is, is really the key lever in getting models uh, to perform and so that's where we see the stack really being uh, exciting uh, is you know you have infrastructure, you have the base models, open source, closed sourced. We have a plethora of options available. Um, again, many open source, many, many uh, amazing options open source. You've got all the application logic on top. Um, and then in the middle, what tunes those models so that they meet the objectives for production is all about developing the data with your knowledge uh, and your objectives. Um, and traditionally, this is very manual and slow. A lot of our work, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Snorkel Flow just as one example, is about trying to make this faster, more agile, more auditable, more explainable by basically lifting the operation from manual one data point at a time labeling to programmatic labeling and programmatic data development, developing data operators that 
do these labeling, filtering, sampling operations as functions um, that can be written quickly, that can be applied to lots of data, that can be inspected and weighted and optimized rather than, again, just a, a bunch of manual ad hoc decisions. So again, you know, I'm not gonna spend uh, uh, most of the talk talking about uh, our product. Um, there will be some deep dives in uh, later in the session, uh, if those are if folks are interested, but I, I'm just going to stop on a slide uh, just to give a sense of our perspective instantiated in the platform that we build. So, the basic loop in snorkel flow, and the basic loop that we think of, and you know, now think broader academically as data centric AI or data centric development, really often can be boiled down to kind of two basic steps. At its core, is you know trying to find subsets of the data where the model gets confused and makes errors. You could call these hallucinations, I'll just say errors, um, uh, and um, and then correcting it via some kind of feedback. This could be labeling, this could be prompting, this could be adjusting the mixture by sampling or filtering. This could be adding new data to, to again, adjust the mixture of data via augmentation or synthetic data generation. Um, but it's some kind of data operation to then um, you know better improve the, the, the model in this in this error area. And obviously in snorkel flow, the idea is to do this programmatically by effectively writing functions um, via code or no code. And if you do this programmatically, by the way, versus manually, you can iterate very rapidly, just like when you were, if you were developing software, if you do this manually, you know, this, this correction step often, uh, you know, consists of weeks or months of waiting for, uh, you know, your colleagues or outsourced annotators to do the data development and then finally getting the results back and testing them. If you do it programmatically, and that's what what's our platform CircleFlow is all about, you can rapidly iterate through these two steps of looking for error modes and correcting them via programmatic data development. But that's the core loop. And you know the way that we build the platform and this aligns with the way we think you know, AI uh, uh, data development should align is we try to make it easy to start with you know, any LLM or foundation model. Again, that metaphor of there are the foundations that you start on, we want to make it really easy to start with the out of the box result, meaning zero or a few shot learning or basic prompting. And then immediately say, okay, where is this making mistakes and how do I tune it? And then once you've done that, all of this, whether labeling or prompting, actually I won't be able to get into it in this session, but there's a, a, a an iClear paper from this year that gets into a little bit of how we actually propose unifying prompting and, and labeling as, as all a form of programmatic uh, uh, supervision. But at a high level, the idea is we want to make it easy to start with an LLM or a foundation model out of the box and then find out where it's making mistakes, rapidly correct it. And then at the end, you can either fine tune that original model to improve it with your corrections, or you can distill it down, meaning train a smaller model um, that'll be uh, uh, just as or more accurate, but, but more specialized. So let me give an example of this. And this is, um, uh, I'm just using one of our latest case studies uh, with uh, uh, co-promoted with the Google team who we're partnered with. Uh, this is using Palm 2, you can guess. Um, there's a corresponding one uh, demo we have out there with, with Azure and GPT-4. It's very similar actually, but I'll just use this. And if folks are curious, there's a corresponding uh, YouTube video and demo if you wanna go deeper into this. But to me, and, and I'll step back again from uh, you know, a snorkel specific promotion. This is really uh, in, uh, kind of encapsulating what we think the arc of a lot of AI project development is going to look like. First, start with a simple kind of out of the box approach. This could be zero shot. This could be few shot for those that are in the weeds uh, on those details. In this case, we just did some simple prompting uh, with Palm 2. Actually, we did all three, but the best approach was some simple prompting. Um, this was on a banking uh, classification chat uh, conversation uh, task. So person sends a note to the chatbot and you want to route it one of 77 ways uh, for this you know, uh, uh, banking setting. So the simplified proxy data set. But even in the simple example, Palm 2 out of the box gets about 50. So F1 score, but you could think 50% accuracy roughly. Um, we then did some prompting in Snorkel Flow. So find the errors, adjust the prompt and do the bunch of a couple of hours of that, get to about 69. Generally prompting uh, is uh, it's great because it's really interactive. It's a great first mile approach. It's super accessible. It's super interactive, pardon me, during development. Generally empirical results mostly show that prompting kind of tops off. You put the same information into a prompt versus fine tuning, fine tuning still does better. It's also more robust to the underlying model choice um, uh, and it can feed into distillation. So generally we think that people will start with prompting and then 
will eventually, for their harder, higher value use cases, have to transition to, to labeling and fine tuning. So we make that seamless in Snorkel Flow again, in Snorkel Flow, a prompt and a, 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 a what we call a labeling function for programmatic labeling are really one and the same thing. So you can start with prompting and then smoothly graduate to programmatic labeling and then fine tuning and distilling. So the cool arc here is that this uh, end model that we fine tuned got 88 F1, so about 38 points better, but also it was 10,000 times smaller. So we went from this big generalist model that had all this information we didn't need and wasn't really tuned for our task to a finely trained specialist model that's 10,000 times as small. And again, that was all done in a couple of hours using our platform Snorkel Flow. But taking a step back from our product, we just think that's going to be a lot of the arc of basically using data development, first prompting, then fine tuning and distillation to go from big generalist that's not good enough for your task and too slow and expensive to small tuned specialist. Um, so I'm about to run out of time and unfortunately not gonna have time to go deeper into that the, the step by step, but I'll just leave with a couple uh, high level ideas. I'm also um, gonna hit time in terms of the Q and A, but hopefully we can keep these Q and A um, uh, questions for the Q and A session that we're going to be having later today, right before lunch. Um, so just want to leave with a couple of ideas that point to our new direction. So first of all, I'll do this rapid fire. Bigger key idea here, programmatic data development is actually applicable. Well, I'll just say data development. And then the way that we do it at Snorkel, programmatic data development is, is key for not just tuning an LLM or a model, but really all parts of these emerging LLM systems. So we have a pretty awesome example uh, with one of our banking uh, customers where they were working over unstructured legal documents, uh, they applied a basic kind of RAG system. So LLM, uh, GPT-4 plus uh, a basic RAG pipeline. It was about 25% accurate on their problems. Again, complex data, very important that it's high accuracy, this wouldn't cut it. So we were able to very rapidly fine tune that. Um, but the key was we weren't just fine tuning the LLM, we were fine tuning multiple components of the system. So unfortunately, I'll have to skip over this but there'll be more actually upcoming, I think in, uh, in Chris's talk, where uh, we did fine tuning of um, the embedding model, the retrieval model, so two parts of the RAG system and of the, the large language model. So this is a key idea that again, it's bigger than Snorkel, um, although Snorkel could help quite a bit, that to get your LLM systems and applications to work, you're gonna often have to custom tune, not just the LLM itself, but actually multiple components, say a RAG system, Another result that actually just hit uh, yesterday to the all pocket eval uh, 2.0 leaderboard, uh, GPT-4 Turbo is, is uh, technically number one, but it's the it's the greater for the uh, eval board also. So um, by that standard, we're, we're currently at the top. I'm sure that'll change. Someone else will beat us in a minute because that's how these eval boards go. The eval result is not the exciting thing. The exciting thing is the method behind it. And we're gonna have a lot more there and you'll hear about it more in the session. But this idea that you can actually use programmatic data development to also tune reward models for alignment um, say uh, via RLHF or DPO. So the bigger idea again is that, uh, and I'll just end on this slide, that uh, you know, not only is data development critical for tuning and customizing your LLM to work in your setting, one of I think the most exciting directions that you'll hear about from some Snorkel uh, speakers uh, today is this idea of tuning all components of an LLM system to really get to, to, to performance, everything from the RAG uh, components to the reward model for alignment. And again, you know, as you'll hear about from the Snorkel speaker today, our, our specific vector within that is making all those data development steps programmatic so they can be 10 to 100 times faster, more auditable, more adaptable. Um, but uh, even if you don't want to dig in, you know, dive fully into the Snorkel point of view, taking one step back, the broader perspective is that data is key and data development is key to all parts of building LLM systems, especially when you're in custom enterprise settings where you're not working with internet data. This is not for a demo that a human can correct. It's got to perform. It's got to perform on your data, your complex domain specific data. In that case, this you know LLM tuning via data development is arguably the key to getting AI to work. And we're excited to share more perspectives on how to actually make that happen uh, in the rest of the summit. So thank you all.